the National Broadcasting Company presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy, calling Washington. <laughs> United States counter-spies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. These counter-spy reports to the American people are brought to you each Friday night. Tonight, Case of the Foreign Fires. There it is. Defense Department storage depot number three. Uh, the gate's about a hundred yards from this corner, isn't it? Yes. Drive right up to it. See if the sentry's awake. No challenge. Looks like he's asleep. Who goes hey, there? <laughs> Shouldn't jump to conclusions. Captain Taylor, Lieutenant Brand, Inspector General's office. Advance and be recognized. You stay at the wheel, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. All right, Sentry. May I see your AGO card, sir? Yeah, here it is. I'll pass it through the gate. We're spot checking security measures for the IG's office. Yes, sir. Your AGO card. Thank you, Corporal. All right, Lieutenant, drive in. Well, security at this entrance is in good shape. Thank you, sir. Um, there's another Sentry at the south gate, isn't there? Yes, sir. We'll see how alert he is when we come on him from the rear. You'll find Corporal Billings... Nice work, Lieutenant. Out like a light. Yeah. All right, load him in the back of the Jeep. We'll take care of the other sentry and then get down to the real business of the evening. That does it, Lieutenant. Cut that mic before you start thinking you're really brass. Hey, you dragged those two sentries in here. What's the idea? When this warehouse goes up in smoke, they go up too. And there's nobody around to identify us. I don't like it, Mike. Murder ain't ah, part of this. Stop crying, Kenny. That's part of our deal. We put a torch to the joint and leave no witnesses. Or don't you want to get paid off? Yeah, yeah. I want to get paid off. Okay, then. Your stuff all set? Yeah, yeah, it's all set. I'll touch off this waste. It'll smolder for about 15 minutes and then reach the gasoline. In 20 minutes, this whole joint will be in flames. Good enough. We'll be far enough away by then. All right, touch it off and let's beat it. Right. All right, let's go. Department of Defense to Counterspy Headquarters. Request immediate investigation of fire in our storage depot number three, Hagerstown, Maryland. Fire consumes stockpile raw materials for defense. Therefore, request this investigation be given personal attention of David Harding, Counterspy Chief. This teletype just came in from the Defense Department, Peter. Huh? The raw material was cinchona bark. Cinchona? That's what they make quinine out of. Yes. And build, building up a big stockpile of it. This fire may have destroyed a third of our entire supply. Any more details than this, Chief? No, not right now. That's why I want you to go up there and take personal charge for me. Will do. Now, our Baltimore field office has already been notified they'll have a mobile laboratory and agents on the scene by the time you get there. Good. And, Peters, I want your investigation to be thorough and send me complete reports. 
From the sparse details we've gotten so far, it's barely possible this fire may be of accidental origin. But not likely, hmm? No. Not when we know how valuable quinine would be in the event of any armed conflict in the East or the Near East. No, Peter? I'll lay odds you'll find evidence of sabotage. What is this, Lieutenant? An all-day march? Will you cut that Lieutenant stuff, Mike? Hey, now, Kenny boy. You shouldn't talk to a captain like that. Some captain. I thought I looked pretty in a uniform. What are you pacing for, Kenny boy? Sit down and relax. I don't feel like relaxing. This place gives me the creeps. Ah, you're a big boy, Kenny. Don't be afraid of an empty house, even if it is supposed to be haunted. That's very funny, but just how long are we going to have to hang around here? Till Gregor shows up and pays off. Yeah, real bright deal he is. We don't know a thing about him. Supposing he don't show. I know all about him, Kenny. He just thinks I don't. He'll show, and he'll pay off. And then a couple of months from now, he'll pay some more. You're going to put the squeeze on? Why not? He's got plenty of dough behind him. I got a duck. And in his line of business, he can't squawk at a squeeze. They shoot spies. And hang murderers. Count me out. I just want the payoff. You can do your whistling act solo. You? Passing up easy change? Now, look. It stopped being easy when we left those soldiers in the warehouse. I never should have let you... Take a look, Kenny. Gregor and that tomato his Irene. Yeah? She can climb in my cell at any time. Okay, Mike, okay. You take the tomato, I'll take the lettuce. Long green bills. Let's get this payoff over with fast and wash up the deal, huh? Well, then let the man in, Kenny. Oh, Gregor, Irene. How do you do? Kenneth? Michael? Hi, hey, Gregor. That high in front of Gregor always sounds so incongruous. I'll take English lessons. You want to teach me? It might be interesting. Irene, let's cut the chatter and get down to business, huh? That's what I like. The direct American approach. You owe us five G's. Pay off and we'll wind us up. G's? He means thousands, Gregor. Of dollars, Gregor. Oh, of course, Michael. What about the other project, shall we say? Uh, well, let's settle this. Wait a minute, minute, Mike. What other projects? Didn't you discuss them with your partner, Michael? Shut up, Kenny. I'll talk to you later. You'll talk now. Were you cooking up a deal with this character for more jobs? He was. We had in mind several projects, the first of which was a rubber stockpile I would be most happy to see vanish. As far as I'm concerned, this was strictly a one-shot deal that I'm sorry I ever got into. May I ask why, Kenneth? Sure, sure. Sabotage. I didn't like the smell of it from the start, but Mike talked me into it for a fast five grand. Don't tell me you are suddenly becoming patriotic, Kenneth. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's it, huh? Perhaps that's why you did not fulfill your part of the agreement. We did the job. Wait a minute, Kenny. Now, look, Gregor, we burned the joint down. Don't try to pull a fast shuffle on us. True, but both sentries were to be eliminated. They were. Not according to this newspaper bulletin. Yeah, read it. No fatalities occurring from the fire have, have as yet been reported, though the two sentries on duty were severely burned. What? That's what it says, Well, they, 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 they must have come to before the fire got a good start, that's all. I'm greatly disappointed, Michael. I had always gotten the impression from American films that your type of man was thorough about these things. Okay, so we're not. Knock the price down. Yeah, but let's wash this up now fast. I'm afraid it's not as simple as that. Gregor. I'll handle this, Irene. What do you mean, not simple? The sentries could identify you both. And you, in turn, could identify us. Not a happy situation. Now listen, Gregor. I think you'd better listen, Wait, Michael. A gun. You can't pull anything like this. I pull nothing, Michael. You have merely handled your job inefficiently. Therefore, you must be liquidated. Gregor, I would like to leave. This I... will only take a minute, Irene. Why, you dirty spy, and I'll get you for the... Your friend Kenneth was impetuous, Michael. Are you... 
You double-crosser. So true. All right, get it over with. Shoot. No, Michael. I have a better use for you than I have for your helper. Turn around. What for? No questions. Turn. What comes next? This. Gregor, Later, why... Later, Irene. I will need your help to carry this one out to our car. He will play a big part in our plans for a really impressive bit of sabotage. Mr. Harding. Where are you, Chief? In here, Peters. Shaving. Oh. Stepping out for the night? No, no. I've been here in the office all day waiting to hear from you. Thought I'd save some time by shaving now. All right, I'll wait till you finish. Oh, go ahead. Talk while I shave. I'm almost through. Well, Chief, there's no doubt the fire was sabotage. Yes, I gathered that. From the news flash about the sentries there. How are they? Suffering from shock and second-degree burns. Yeah? Couldn't question them? Little. One of them said he could identify the men who did it, and that's when the doctor ushered me out of the room. Uh, one will be able to question them more thoroughly. Well, the doc said probably tomorrow, day after at the latest. Oh, good. The best part about it, Chief, is this. We've got a clear set of fingerprints on one of the arsonists. Fingerprints? Where? On the leather-tie belt the sentries wear on guard duty. The sentries apparently were dragged into the warehouse by those belts. Oh, that's great. I'll get that, Chief. Uh, Our fingerprint section's classifying the prints now. We may get an identification out of it. Well, I hope so. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Harding's office. No, this is not Mr. Harding speaking. Just a moment. For you, Chief. A female. I'll be right there. <clears throat> What's she look like, Chief? Or is it a secret? Stop trying to be a comic. Give me that phone. Yes, sir. Hello? Is this Mr. David Harding? It is. You would perhaps like to know something about the fire in the defense warehouse in Maryland. Why, of course. Who is this? I will meet you if you can guarantee me protection. If you've got anything to tell us, you'll be protected to the full extent of our ability. Very well, then. I will come to your headquarters. When? How will we know you? What is it, Dave? Wait. I will be there in half an hour wearing a... Carmel's hair coat and black tam. Yes? Meet me at the entrance to your headquarters. And when I am safely in your custody, I will tell you not only about the fire, but about plans that are being made for even greater sabotage against our country. Back to Counter Spy in a moment. It is urgent that all of us give full and continued attention to the problem of employing workers with physical handicaps. Employing physically handicapped workers makes them self-supporting, saves public funds, increases the number of taxpayers, boosts production, and benefits your community. Prejudice and lack of correct information are the greatest obstacles to employment of workers who are handicapped, but who are otherwise fully equipped to do a good job in business and industry. The injured or crippled, whether disabled by birth, accident, or disease, should be encouraged to get in touch with their state divisions of vocational rehabilitation or with the Veterans Administration if their disability took place before July 26, 1947, in connection with service and in the armed forces. Those ready and trained for work should be urged to register with the state employment offices. Employers should also be reminded to use these facilities. For further information, write Vice Admiral Ross T. McIntyre, room 1136, United States Department of Labor, Washington 25, D.C. And now, back to Counter Spy. You sure she said half an hour, Mr. Harding? That's what I heard, Peter. It's almost 40 minutes since the call and no camel's hair coat and black tan yet. Well, we'll just have to wait. There's a cab stopping now, Chief. Well, that could be. That's her. Look at her. She's weaving. Is it? Come on, Peter. Chief, that car coming up behind the cab. Hey, what's Stop, going on? Chief. Peter, take the car. I'll get the girl. Miss. Miss. Peters, come here. My 
shots went wide, Chief, but I got the license number and make of the car. Get it right up to our radio communications room and out to the Washington police patrol cars. Right. And call our medical section. Tell them to send a stretcher out here. This girl's been hit bad. To all Washington police cars from Counterspy headquarters, be on alert for Black Packard Sedan, Montana license number 891-72-13. Occupants armed and dangerous. If car spotted, notify Counterspy headquarters immediately. That is all. How is she, Doctor? Is it serious? Well, uh, not the uh, wounds. It's just a flesh wound in the arm. The bullet went clear through, and uh, her side was creased by a bullet. I see. Well, can I talk to her? Uh, I'm afraid not. The effects of shock. She's in a state of trauma, almost like a drug sleep. When can I talk to her? Well, uh, when she comes out of shock. Any idea when that'll be? Oh, uh, ten minutes, ten hours. Oh, great. Do you mind standing by until she does come out of the shock? I'll want to talk to her immediately. You better check the fact that I can. I'll be standing by, Mr. Harding. Uh, do you want to move her, or will she be all right in that couch in my office? Oh, better to let her remain where she is. All right, whatever you say. How is she, Chief? Unconscious for the moment. Anything on that car? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Harding. I'll go in and keep an eye on her. Right, Doctor. Let me know the minute I can talk to her. Yes, sir. Now, what about the car, Peter? No trace of it, Chief. But there was a report just a few minutes ago of a car accident on the banks of the Potomac. Oh? A black sedan went into the river. I'm having it raised now, and I'll bet it's our baby. Empty. Did you check on the Montana license? Yes. I called our field office in Montana. They'll wake the clerk of the motor vehicle bureau and get to us as soon as possible. Good. Uh, what about the bullets? We found the three of them on the steps to our headquarters, Chief. The laboratory's got them now. Meanwhile, we got an unexpected break. Yeah, fine. Right. When that car drove away, it went through a puddle of water... And we've got a beautiful set of photos of the tire tracks. Good. I've put them through the regular routine. We'll have agents checking them as soon as we raise that car from the river. That's fine, Peters. Now, any report on the fingerprints on that sentry's belt? Not yet, Chief. I'll check that right away. Okay. But first, Peters, let's take out some insurance on the girl. How? There are a bunch of reporters in the lobby very anxious to know what this is all about. Tell them the whole story, but embellish one fact. Tell them the girl was fatally wounded. Okay, Chief. Now, you keep me posted on the results you get from the bullets and the tire tracks. I'll stick here. I want to talk to that girl the minute she regains consciousness. Well, uh, Mr. Harding. Uh, uh, Chief. Uh, 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 oh, oh, Peter. Fine thing. While I'm running my feet off chasing lab reports. Well, never mind, Peters. In this job, you have to catch your sleep while you can. That sounds good. Besides, that's why it's good to be the boss. Oh, what time is it? That's more like the reason, and it's almost two in the morning. Two? Well, that girl's been unconscious for almost three hours. Just about. Hope she comes around soon. Well, what have you got? Well, the prints on the sentry's belt belong to a guy we've got in our files. American? Yes. Michael Deacon, a small-time arsonist. I've already put out a pickup on him. Good. What about the license? We drew a blank there. That Montana license belongs to a Miss Abigail Buffington, whose own car and license at the moment are in her garage in Montana while she's probably trying to get back to the sound sleep our agent woke her from. Yeah, a phony plate, huh? Mm-hmm. And nothing on the tire track yet, either. And the bullets? Now, there's something that... Uh, uh Mr. Harding? Oh, uh, hello, Peters. Hello, Doc. Are the girl's conscious, Doctor? Yes, no trace of shock. Splendid recovery... She could go home right now if she had to with just a fresh dressing on that flesh wound in her arm. Well, then I can talk to her. For as long as you want. Uh, before you do, Chief, take a look at this report on the bullets. Uh -huh. Mm hmm I see. It's very interesting. Uh, doctor. Yes, Mr. Harding? Get me a complete medical report on the shooting as soon as you can, will you? Certainly, sir. You stick out here, Peters. I may need you. Right, Chief. Well, how are you now, Miss Waters? Oh, Mr. Harding? Yes. You, you know my name. From the cards in your purse. Oh, of course. Listen, Mr. Harding, I, I must tell you immediately about the fire in Maryland. Uh, we know about it, Miss Waters, the fact that it was sabotaged. Yes, but do you know there is another such incident planned for tonight? What? Where? At a rubber depot in Purdy, Virginia. Yeah, go on. Uh, Peters. Yes, Chief. Get this. 
Continue, Miss Waters. Well, it's the Defense Department rubber stockpile in Purdy, Virginia. It is to be set fire to tonight by a man named Gregor Markov. All right, Peters, get busy on notifying Purdy. Right away, Chief. Now, Miss Waters. Oh, please, Mr. Harding, before you continue, could I ask a favor? And what is it? Would it be possible for you to tell the papers that I'm dead? The shooting, it would be so good that way I could live without fear. It has already been done, Miss Waters. Oh, wonderful. Now I have much to tell you. Well, yes, go on. Well, as you may have gathered, I am not American, though I am a naturalized citizen. Yes. I came to this country in 1936 at the height of the Depression. Uh, I can guess part of the story. You became involved in quite a few causes and activities, huh? Yes, I'm sorry to say... Take... that depot in Purdy, it's already ablaze. They're fighting the fire now. What? But it can't be. It was for tonight. Well, it's now 2 o'clock in the morning, Miss Waters. Oh, I've been unconscious that long. Yes, now, Peters, get out there right away. Take charge of the investigation. All right, Chief. Now, Miss Waters, oh, go right ahead. Please. Mr. Harding, I... I suddenly feel very weak... Could we continue this later? You have more to tell me. Much. Many names and people you would not imagine would betray this country, but uh, my strength is not up to it now. Well, you can rest right here. Oh, I would rather my own apartment. Your own apartment? It is one that I've kept for myself. They don't know of it. If you could only put a guard on it. Well, all right, Miss Waters. I'll have one of our agents escort you home, and we'll have an agent watching your apartment every second you're there. Oh, Thank you, Mr. Hart. Uh, do you know how to use a gun? A little, but I, I haven't got one. Well, I'll give you one, just for added insurance. Oh, thank you, Mr. Harding. I'll be around to see you in the morning. We'll pick up this conversation then. All right, Mr. Harding. I, I'm sure that what I have to tell you will hold many surprises for you. I'm sure it will, Miss Waters. Now, just rest here, and I'll send for an agent in the car to take you home. Thank you, Mr. Crand. That's all right, Miss Waters. You you will be at my door all night. Well, that's the job Mr. Harding gave me. Don't worry, I'll be here. That is good to know. Good night. Good night. Hello, Irene. Oh. Gregor, you had plenty of time? More than enough. How did your part go? Perfectly. There's a counter-spy outside the door now guarding me. Wonderful. I'll be perfectly safe in here, then. Yes. The depot is destroyed? I'm afraid not completely, but that's unimportant. The main item is for you to gain the confidence of the counter-spies. What about Michael's body? In the depot, burned beyond recognition. But my rings, watch, and identification are all on him. Well, that will confirm my story about you. Should be the first step in getting you into the confidence of the counter spy. Yes, but I'll have to have more to tell Mr. Harding when he comes here in the morning. There will be plenty to tell. Here's a list of names of people who have aided us in the past. You can betray them. They will do some talking themselves. They can tell nothing of value. The important thing is to get you firmly into counter spy headquarters. Then we will be able to learn much of value to us. Oh, I hope so, Gregor. Uh, how's your arm, my dear? Uh, throbs a bit, but otherwise all right. <laughs> it was fortunate we made the two wounds before I left for the counter-spy headquarters. At least it allowed us to control the seriousness of the injuries. It was almost a mistake, Irene. I noticed you staggering when you left the cab. If you had collapsed before, I had a chance to fire. I didn't. But I am ready to collapse now, so let me retire. Oh, I would like to be fresh for the fairy tale as I must tell Mr. Harding in the morning. Mr. Harding. Good morning, Miss Waters. Okay, Crandall, you can go home and get some shut eye now. I'll take over. Thank you, Mr. Harding. Oh, come in. Tell me, how do you feel this morning? Excellent, but the fire in Purdy was the rubber depot at total loss. Not quite, but I'd like to show you something. Yes? This ring and this watch. Have you ever seen them before? Yes. They are Gregor Markov's. Where did you get them? From a body found in the fire. Gregor's dead? The way we reconstruct it, he set fire to the depot. He started to leave, and he must have slipped on some oil slick. He was knocked out. That was it. Fracture of the skull. Gregor dead. Wonderful. 
Now, Mr. Harding, I can speak without fear. Except for the fact that the body wasn't Gregor's. What? There were enough fingerprints to identify him as one Michael Deacon. I don't understand. And the gentleman had been dead for at least three hours before the fire started, so he couldn't have set it off. Which makes me think, Miss Waters, that your quick acceptance of Markoff's death is a little too convenient. Stay where you are, Mr. Harding. Don't forget you gave me this gun yourself. Now we're out in the open, huh? Quite. Gregor! I heard, Irene. So, this is Gregor Markoff. Yes, Mr. Harding. It's a shame your American methods of crime deduction are so efficient. A beautiful scheme to gain the confidence of the counter-spies. With you in this apartment, we'd have been guarding the very man we'd be searching for. It's too bad. It's a total loss. Not a total loss, Mr. Harding. Oh? At least from this, we can salvage your death, which will be quite a blow to America's counter-espionage forces. You think you'll escape? Perhaps not. But it's a good bargain. Our lives for yours. Sorry, Mr. Harding. <laughs> Stay where you are, both of you. It's all right, Peters. Just keep them covered. You've got three more shots, Miss Waters. Why not use them? They're blanks, too. Blank? What is this? Another example of American methods of crime deduction, Markov. Miss Waters, you were under suspicion from the moment you left our headquarters last night. But why? I said nothing to... No, but your wounds did, as well as the bullets that were fired at you. Our laboratory reports show that the bullets never entered your body. No traces of blood or flesh. And the wound in your arm was parallel to the ground, not at an angle, as it would have been if you'd been shot climbing the steps of Counter Spy headquarters. That's why we decided to give you that gun and see how far you'd carry this. Better not move. This gun isn't loaded with blanks. Just move them in one direction, Peters. Out. We'll really show them the efficiency of our American methods in dealing with spies and saboteurs. Tune in every Friday, same time, same station, to Counter Spy. Listen next Friday for the exciting Case of the Curious Conspiracy. When certain short-sighted individuals took a long chance to obtain scarce war materials, your counter-spies had to adopt very unusual methods of investigation. The full facts will be released next Friday in Case of the Curious Conspiracy on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York, was directed by Leonard L. Bass, dramatized by Palmer Thompson and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer. Counter Spy is produced by Phillips H. Lord. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tomorrow night, Dennis Day joins the battle against hoarding with some merry and nearly disastrous results. Judy Canova discovers 500 shares of supposedly worthless stock, which almost turn her into a millionaire. But millionaire or not, she's the same lovable Judy. The chimes tomorrow mean the Dennis Day Show and the Judy Canova Show.